Um, and thank you, Simon, for that introduction. I'm very passionate about pertussis because I was working as a PICU fellow at Starship in the height of the pertussis epidemic between 2011 and 2014. And during that time, we had 38 children and infants come into our ICU with pertussis, and three of those children died. And so we ended up having a look at all of those children over that time. And so pertussis has been around for at least 1,400 years. The phrase, the 100-day cough, actually comes from an, a Chinese scholar. And he is attributed to the text where he wrote, if there is a cough within 100 days, only one or two of 10 will recover. The first clinical description of pertussis was actually in Paris in 1578. And then these two good-looking men, Jules Bourdais, from where the word Bordetella comes from, and Octave Jean Joux in 1906, actually observed the organism in the bacteria of a five-month-old baby with pertussis. The discovery remained questionable because they were unable to cultivate or isolate it, so they went on to develop a medium in 1912. They actually tried to make a vaccine that was unsuccessful, and it took these two ladies in 1945 to develop the vaccine. So you can see that the vaccine was developed in 1945 and the incidence of pertussis dropped quite quickly down to low levels in the 1970s. But since the 1980s, the levels have started to rise again. And following on from that severe epidemic that we had recently, worldwide and children under five years of age, it's estimated that 24.1 million children were infected and 160,000 of them died. And so pertussis is a worldwide problem. So today we're going to talk about critical pertussis, we're going to learn how to identify infants at risk and we're going to discuss current therapies. So we've got classical pertussis, we've got those three distinct phases and it affects people of all ages, we've got older children, adults and elderly, but these aren't the types of people that come into paediatric intensive care. It's infants who are unimmunized or partially immunized that get severe pertussis. And this may be because of parental choice, but largely it's because these infants are too young to be immunized. So when I was looking at these 38 children that came into our ICU, um, I looked at some of the definitions, and there aren't any formal guidelines, but looking at the literature, most people seem to agree that critical pertussis refers to any child that is admitted to the intensive care unit. But if you look at all of those children that come into the intensive care unit, I think you can divide those children into very two different clinical phenotypes. There's a really rare small group that get malignant or fulminant pertussis, and these two terms seem to be used interchangeably in the literature. And then there's everybody else. There are a much larger group of children that I've just called benign pertussis. So looking at these a little bit more clearly now, so infants with malignant pertussis are those who have pneumonia, pulmonary hypertension, they develop cardiogenic shock, they get hyperleukocytosis, seizures and encephalopathy. They get admitted to ICU for advanced organ life support, they need intubation and ventilation, they may need nitric oxide, inotropes or vasopressors, and then they may go on to have investigational therapy such as an exchange transfusion or ECMO. And these babies may die despite intensive care. And then there's everybody else with benign pertussis. They're a much larger group of infants. Their illness is characterized by apnea, desaturation, bradycardia. They're admitted to the intensive care unit for close observation and monitoring. They're the ones that we put in the HDU. The nurses sort of touch them every now and then when they're having a paroxysm. They may need a little bit of blow by oxygen sitting up and sometimes they need to be bagged through their paroxysm. So malignant pertussis is really important to identify early. It's a rapidly evolving syndrome. And the time from initial presentation to clinical deterioration or death can be, can be very short. And so these children need to be referred early to intensive care unit um, and transported for advanced organ life support or trials of investigational therapies. So how do we know when a child comes into the when we get that phone call from a referring physician that this child is going to go on to develop malignant pertussis. So I was faced with this exact same problem when I was a fellow on call during a long public holiday weekend. I had a phone call about these X36 week twins. They were 10 days of age. Their mother had had a cough in the final stages of her pregnancy and twin one had a paroxysmal cough and twin two was asymptomatic. 
Now the baby had, twin one had had a full blood count on the day of presentation, it had clotted, and so they'd repeated it the next day and that was when they called me. And his white cell count was 31, his lymphocytes were 19.6 and his neutrophils were 8.7. And the local paediatrician was asking me whether I should send a transport team for these babies. Now just to give you a little bit of context, I work at the only PICU in New Zealand, at Starship Children's Hospital. And we have 21 district health boards throughout New Zealand. All of them have an adult intensive care unit except for one. And the adult intensivists are really good at resuscitating and stabilising these babies. But if they need to have advanced organ life support or if they need an exchange transfusion and certainly if they need to go on ECMO, then they need to be transported to our unit. Now Starship is all the way at the top of the North Island there in Auckland and these babies were in our furthest referral centre down in Invercargill. And it would take our team about 12 hours on average to return back from a flight to Invercargill. And we'd recently had this sad situation where a baby had been um, sick in, in Christchurch with pertussis. We'd sent a transport team down there, but unfortunately the baby was too sick to be transported and the baby ended up dying in Christchurch. And so with all of this swimming around in my head, I was trying to decide whether I should dispatch a team for what was really one baby that was coughing and one baby that was asymptomatic. It's quite a long flight. It's a long way to displace a family from their home and it may be, unnecessary, may be unnecessary. So I just wanted to have a view from the audience. Can you raise your hand if you think you would have gone and collected these babies? Oh good, only one, because I didn't. <laughs> I was really tough back then. I would have gone and got them now. Um, but I, in that time, so I left them down there. I went to the literature and I thought, how can I identify babies at risk? So Berger and colleagues published the largest prospective study in 2013 looking at this and 95 to 97% of babies that get admitted to the ICU are under a year of age and the majority are under 12 weeks of age. And this graph shows you that the majority who die or go on to develop pneumonia or pulmonary hypertension are in the first 12 weeks of life. And young age is undoubtedly linked to immunisation status. In New Zealand, you get your first vaccine when you're six weeks of age, and then it's three months and then five months, and with increasing number of vaccinations, you get drop-off in the rate of admission to ICU, and certainly a drop-off in those that die. A paper has looked at physiological data at first presentation, and Murray looked at infants with more severe pertussis compared to those with less severe, and the maximum heart rate was 210 compared to 180, and the heart rate greater than 70 was more common and shorter course of illness for those with more severe pertussis. So we also looked at our patients with pertussis, and we divided them into the malignant group and the benign group, and we showed that blood pressure, systolic, diastolic, and mean blood pressures were much lower in those with malignant pertussis, and those with malignant pertussis had a higher temperature and a higher heart rate at hospital presentation. We also looked at that data at PICU presentation. It was also significant that they had a lower blood pressure, a higher temperature, and a higher heart rate. And the white cell count characteristics of um, pertussis are well known. We know that it's characterized by a leukocytosis with an absolute lymphocytosis. So if you look at a full blood count, the white cell count there is 16 and the overwhelming majority of them are lymphocytes and that's characteristic. And if you look at the film, the lymphocytes are small, mature and they are hyperchromatic and they have cleaved nuclei. So the earliest indicator that white cell count was linked to mortality was from this paper in London. They showed that they had 13 children who were admitted to their PICU. They were all under 12 weeks of age and all four infants with a white cell count that was greater than 100 died. So Berger and colleagues also looked at this. Their peak white cell count was 26 in survivors compared to 66 in those that died. And Murray, who was looking at more severe infections, their peak white cell count was 74 compared to 26. And we also looked at that not only did they have a higher total white cell count, but their lymphocytes were higher and so were their neutrophils, both at presentation to hospital and at presentation to the intensive care unit. 
But the problem is, how do you know when to transfer a baby to ICU? And when do you even initiate an exchange transfusion? What is the white cell count threshold? Nobody really knows the answer to that. Is it 25? Is it 50? When I was training, I was told it was 75. 100 seems a little bit late. No one really knows the answer to that. So armed with a little bit more information, I decided to ring back the paediatrician on day three because I was starting to feel a little bit anxious about these babies. And this was Quinn too, he was the one that was asymptomatic, so he'd started to cough. His white cell count stayed in the low 20s and the lymphocyte count there was high and that's pretty classic of pertussis. So as I was writing down the results of twin one, I started to break out into a cold sweat. You can see that the white cell count went from 31 to 64 on day three, but also that the neutrophils were high and they were much higher than the lymphocytes and that was not something that I was really expecting. And even though that twin remained asymptomatic, I decided to send a transport team for them. So I went back to the literature to see what I could find about neutrophils and there was this one paper in 2003 that looked at neutrophil count predicting mortality. They had 12 children in Leicester, again they were all less than 12 weeks of age and their non-survivors had a mean neutrophil count of 41 and their survivors had a mean count of 10 and they postulated whether the increased neutrophil count could reflect an underlying systemic inflammatory response syndrome and those children with malignant pertussis. But again, my same problem with threshold existed. At what threshold do you transfer these babies or even do an exchange transfusion? And then I started to think, maybe it's not so much the absolute value, but perhaps it's the changing milieu of the white cell count from one of a predominant lymphocytosis to one of a predominant neutrophilia, reflecting some kind of inflammatory response syndrome. And that's where we thought about the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. So if we take twin one, if we divide the number of neutrophils by the number of lymphocytes, you'll get a ratio that's greater than one, and perhaps that's a predictor of mortality for malignant pertussis. Twin two, who'd re remained asymptomatic, his neutrophils divided by his lymphocytes would give a ratio that was less than one, and maybe that would indicate that things were gonna be okay. So looking at the clinical syndrome, the tra transport team arrived in Invercargill and as they arrived in the hospital, twin one had a massive desaturation and went on to have a pulmonary hypertensive crisis. The baby needed to be intubated and ventilated and a chest X-ray showed a dense right upper lobe pneumonia. Now that neutrophil lymphocyte ratio had become greater than one about eight hours before the child developed any symptoms at all whereas twin two had a ratio that was less than one and remained benign throughout. So we decided to look at this in our group of infants. The infants with benign pertussis had a ratio less than one at hospital presentation and presentation to the ICU, whereas infants with malignant pertussis had a ratio that was greater than one at both hospital presentation and presentation to the PICU unit. So other predictors of death are widely reported in the literature. They include pneumonia and they include pulmonary hypertension. And so we analysed our data and all 11 infants who had malignant pertussis had one or more of a heart rate greater than 180, a total white cell count greater than 25 and a neutrophil lymphocyte ratio that's greater than one. And so we're currently testing this prediction model um, in Australia and New Zealand by collecting prospective data to see whether this is accurate or not. So twin one having entered our unit with pulmonary hypertension and pneumonia, this leads us on to current therapies, which I'm gonna to have to whiz through for time. So the therapy can be divided into supportive therapy and then investigational therapy. Supportive therapy, I think, is undisputed, which includes antibiotics, isolating the baby, intubation and ventilation, nitric oxide, inotropes and vasopressors, renal replacement therapy, and anticonvulsant therapy for seizures. What I think is a little bit more interesting is the investigational therapies, which include exchange transfusion, leukofiltration, leukophoresis, ECMO, hydroxyurea, and n acetylcysteine so I'll go through these. This early post-mortem study showed that the pulmonary arteries and venules are clogged up with these white cell thrombi, and so it was postulated that maybe if we could reduce the white cell mass, maybe things would get better. There are technically three ways in which you can do that. 
It's with exchange transfusion most commonly, but also leukofiltration and leukophoresis has been reported in the literature. Um, the first case report was by Romano in 2004. He reported on a three-month-old baby with pertussis pneumonia, hypoxemia, and hyperleukocytosis. He survived following a double-volume exchange transfusion. So the largest cohort of, um, that looked at critical pertussis by Berger looked at 25 children where their white cell count was greater than 50, and it didn't really make a difference to survival whether they had leukoreduction or not. So there were eight survivors out of 13 who had leukoreduction, therapy, and then there were nine survivors out of 12 who did not receive leukoreduction therapy. So there's no evidence to support or refute exchange transfusion. There's a single case report of leukophoresis where they used an apheresis machine. Unfortunately, this baby who wasn't coagulopathic beforehand developed a severe coagulopathy and died from bilateral intracranial hemorrhages. And then there was this 12-day-old baby with pertussis pneumonia who had a double volume exchange transfusion, was placed onto VA ECMO for severe pulmonary hypertension. A leukofiltration filter was put into the ECMO circuit and this baby was successfully discharged home. This brings me on to ECMO. With a search of the database showed that there were 200 infants who underwent ECMO for pertussis with a very low survival rate of 28%. Um, we've had two babies with pertussis on ECMO at Starship. They both had prolonged periods of time on ECMO. Um, and at the end of the ECMO course, this is what their lungs looked like on chest X-ray. They were massively calcified, which reflected massive necrosis of the lungs, and they both died. We as a group have decided that we won't put babies with pertussis on ECMO anymore. Um, but again, that's up to the clinician. Um, I keep in touch with my, my Toronto alumni on a WhatsApp group and I got recently messaged about a baby with pertussis. Everyone seems to message me when a baby with pertussis comes into their unit, but they told me about this baby who they'd successfully treated with hydroxyurea um, based on this case report which is used in the oncological problem to reduce white cell count, um, which I thought was interesting. And then there was this single case report using N-acetylcysteine to reduce the viscosity of the mucus. Um, and this baby had a lavage every two to three days over a two-week period and was successfully discharged home. So in summary, I think in terms of supportive therapy, I think early referral to a paediatric intensive care unit for all unimmunized or partially immunized infants with at least one or more of that, at least talk to your unit early because they need to be up in an ICU for advanced life support. In terms of investigational therapy, we still do exchange transfusion as a group, but I'm starting to think that maybe we would do that with only babies that have malignant disease, rather than looking at a specific white cell threshold. So our twin babies are now five years of age. Twin one had a bit of a torrid time. He had pneumonia, pulmonary hypertension. Um, he was intubated and ventilated for a prolonged period of time. He underwent two exchange transfusions. He developed a right thalamic infarct with seizures. He was in ICU for six weeks. He was in hospital for a further eight weeks. He had multiple admissions to the hospital with lower respiratory tract infections, but he's recently been discharged from respiratory services. Um, and Twin 2 sort of got away with things pretty lightly, and he's otherwise well. Thank you.